Good morning. <laughs> Having technology issues, hold on. <laughs> this morning's scripture reading is from Ephesians 1, uh, 7 through 14. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Thank you, Nick. I don't know how you spent your day yesterday. I uh, spent the morning hours trying to figure out what was going on in Washington. I had heard a little bit. I saw commercials. Didn't get any emails. Usually when there's events like that, uh, there are events like that. I uh, you get emails and I can kind of look at a number of things. But if you're not aware, uh, Jonathan Kahn had planned for a while to have... A, an event called the return. He called it a solemn, a sacred assembly. And being Jewish, I think he uh, was connecting it to uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which starts tonight. It, in between that, Rosh Hashanah, ten days before, is the, uh, the the beginning of the civil year. It's so hard. They always say it's the beginning of the year, but when reading the scripture, it says the seventh month. The seventh month is not the beginning of the year, but they just that's just the way they count things and. And what, you know what year it is, Andy? And according to the Jewish people, it's like year 5,000. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't adjust their calendar because of Christ. And you can kind of understand that. But just, just understanding that he called for this. And it was just many speakers, many people, and, and almost all of them prayed. They weren't just there to speak. Uh, there was music and, and so forth. It started actually 6 o'clock the night before. And uh, then started at 9 and was, was moving through. So... It, it was a blessing to kind of see that was going on. But then I had heard more about Franklin Graham because I saw that on TV as he was uh, promoting that. He had a, a prayer, mar prayer march from uh, the Lincoln Memorial all the way to the Capitol and stopped at seven different locations and prayed for different things. Now, what I didn't finally, didn't finally understand until the evening, I had taped some things on TV that I thought were going to be at one show, and they weren't. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not going to make fun of the station. It's just they, they weren't what they promised to be. But it was actually Jonathan Kahn and Franklin Graham sitting down being interviewed about the two events. Why would you plan two large events in the same area? <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> but um, Jonathan Kahn was doing it first. Franklin Graham felt burdened to do this. And he called Jonathan and said, you know, Kenny said, hey, let's do it. And a lot of the speakers interchanged, a lot of people praying and so forth. So it was two Christians getting along, which is always exciting to see. Uh, but the purpose was to pour out prayers of confession and repentance before the Lord. Um, Jonathan Kahn said, he, I don't know how long before, he, he believed that the year 2020 was going to be a year of shaking. I don't know when he first came up with that thought, but he said it, do you feel like it's been a year of shaking? It has. And, and just really, he's the one who wrote the harbinger and said, you start seeing these things happen, and that's a good sign that your country is going to end. And, and he and not trying to be overdramatic, because then I'm listening to Franklin Graham, and he says the same thing. He said, if you look at how nations can deteriorate, it can happen with you know, a seven-year period. I don't think he was talking about the tribulation. He was talking about things in history that where you can see how a, a country can completely turn around in seven years and, and because of the sin of this country. And, and he kept saying, 
He said, I'm, I'm 60. If the Lord takes me home or in my 60s, I don't know what year. But he said, but, but I think about my children and our grandchildren. Then he said, but if, if what happens, you know, happens, maybe they won't be here either, you know, that, that it'll be the, the, you know. But the fact is, people always quote, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will come and heal their land. And I'm, I'm a little bit too of a perfectionist in my trying to study what to say. Is that only for the Jewish people? Wait a second. The church is his people. And I have to kind of apologize to those people I might have uh, dissuaded from claiming that verse. See, I don't know if the Lord's going to uh, heal the land of America. But he'll heal the land where his people are praying. Now, for how long? Franklin Graham said, I don't think we can stop it. We've, we're just so far down the road. But maybe we can slow it down a little bit. All right Now, these are the words of men from the scriptures, but we don't know. So many people trying to predict the future, we don't know. But it, it just struck me. It struck me that, the opportunities, and what Franklin Graham said, just to slow it down so we can reach out to more people so they can hear the gospel. And last night, I was asked to say a few words, five to ten minutes, at the uh, Santa for America concert that uh, Nick Sabatine uh, was, was putting together. And I'd never been to the location, had no idea what I was walking into. It was kind of a wild night. Uh, it, was, it was a good night. Um, the, the band was excellent, and and just understand that. But they had speakers starting around 5 o'clock, and I was asked to be one of them. It turns out that I didn't say hello to the right person, and they almost moved me out of the schedule. But uh, somebody stepped up and said, oh, he's here. And there was actually two people that that almost happened to. But when I got up, I was challenging them to not think about a government solution to our problem. I listed some of the problems that we talk about from a political standpoint. And, and I said, but... I quote John Adams all the time. <laughs> he said, there's no government armed with power that can deal with the passions of men. You have to have the change from within. So I said, the source of our problem is not any issue you want to talk about. It's sin. And I don't know if they expected that from me, but the Yaska Baptist minister to come speak. He's going to talk about the gospel. And, and what was neat was Larry Bird was also there. And he shared afterwards, he came up and he said, thank you, you covered a number of things so I could do some other things. <laughs> and we kind of ta uh, tandem, uh, tag team the, the message of the gospel and how we should be praying for this election and praying for our nation. Because the goal, I, there are people there that I'm sure do not know the Lord. In fact, someone introduced himself and said, I'm this, I'm not born again, but I'm this. And it was a denomination, I won't try to, uh, but I said, keep looking to Jesus. That's all I said. Wow. And he said, you know, Jesus is the one who said you had to be born again. I didn't make that up, uh, but I didn't say that. I just said, keep looking to Jesus. So it was an interesting day it, it, to watch the crowds that were in Washington. And, and for those of you that get TBN, TBN had a, a coverage of it. But tomorrow night at 8, they have their praise program, and they're saying that's going to be a summary of both events, uh, kind of videotaped and put together. I hope they get it done in time. Uh, but 8 o'clock tomorrow night, if you get TPN, you might want to watch and see if you, if you didn't see any. Plus, these things, are, I think, are all on YouTube and they repeated there. But it's just, we need to pray. We need to pray. Now, where does that take me today? We're in Ephesians. And our passage today, as you would see, our songs are about God's salvation. And we can never say enough about our salvation. Oh, but I've heard that before. Are you undone? by the mercy of the Lord. If you're not, maybe you don't realize just how sinful you are and were. God has forgiven the, the believer, but we, we had a terrible sin problem. That's going to come in, in some messages coming up. But as we talk about salvation today, this and last week's message could have all been one, but that would have been way too long. Um, but if you took the two messages, last week was God's choice. This week, it's our blessing. God's choice our blessing. And just to remind you some of the choices we talked about last week, God chose his servants. He chooses who he's going to use. God chose, chooses his saints. Chose, I said past tense, seems present tense to us, but God chose his saints. He chose his saints. He knows who are those that are going to believe in him. And it's not the church that picks up, picks who's a saint. God declares all believers are saints. God chose the only Savior. I have no problem walking into an event 
its political nature and telling him there is only one Savior. And I, that, that's offensive. I'm sorry it's offensive. But it's the truth. Um, God shows our blessing. He knows every blessing you need. Yeah, but I'm praying for this. If you need it, he'll provide it. If you don't need it, accept that you don't need it. He chose the blessings that he's going to give you. God chose what is holy and blameless. And if you remember, we talked about what Jesus said is holy and blameless. Love. To love God and to love one another. You want to talk about your holiness, it should be reflected in your love. And then God chose his adopted children. All that dis- they're wrangling about how God shows and is it fair that God gets a choice and we don't have a choice? We do have a choice. We respond. We have a choice to respond or not respond. But don't get worried about how it works. Get excited about that he adopted you into his family. Now I'm getting on the last week's medicine. But that's just God's choice is the foundation of all that happened. It started with God. Well, today we're looking at God's blessing, the blessings we have our blessing that we have because of God's choice. So that's my proposition. God's choice permits our blessing. It opens the door to the blessing we receive. If God had not made the choice, the door wouldn't be open. So we're going to be talking about our blessing, and we're in Ephesians 1, 7 through 10, which Nick read, and we're going to be looking at that. But before we go any further, let's bow in a word of prayer. I thank you, Father. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for um, gospel-believing, Christ-following people all around the world. The events yesterday weren't just in in the United States. They were also uh, around the world. Um, Different events were being held. We we recognize that uh, you have used America in mighty ways in, in world history, but it's not something we can assume that will continue, especially if we're not surrendered to you and repentant before you. Help us to humble ourselves before you. Bless us as we look into these blessings. Sometimes, especially if, you, if we were saved young, we just kind of assume, well, that's always been that way. Sometimes we need to take a look and say, what would life be like without a Savior? And just see that uh, we have so much to praise you for. I pray that you'll have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I am or say will hinder what you want to say through your Spirit to us. Jesus, this is your holy name I pray. Amen. There's three statements we're going to make from this passage about our blessings. They all begin with the passage in him. It's through faith that you find yourself in Christ. When you're in Christ, you are declared righteous and you are saved. In that salvation, there are three blessings I want to look at from this. In him, verse 7 says, we have redemption. In him we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. We could chew on those couple of verses for a long time. Redemption. A ransom has been paid because we are slaves to sin. We have been ransomed from slavery to sin by the blood of Jesus. We are bought out of the, of the slave market. Slaves to sin, we are free because of what Jesus has done. And, and think about all the, the, the political talk about, we've got to do something about people's college debt. We need to, they go into way too much debt. They don't even acknowledge the debt of sin that they cannot pay. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. He paid a debt we could never pay. He bought us, bought us out of the slave market. Second Peter 1 says, And now may the grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Christ, Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has given everything we need for a godly life. I want you to hear that phrase again. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. When he bought us out of slavery to sin, he didn't just save us for heaven and save us from hell. He gives us the power to live a godly life. 
We don't just sit around and say, well, I'm going to heaven. I'm just going to live the way I want. No, he saved us for a purpose to make us more like himself, to make us ready to walk according to his power. Don't let anybody tell you you have to. Oh, you're, that's just the way you are. Think about Linda Johnson in recovery. Well, that's just the way I am. I've been hooked on this stuff forever. Got to see uh, one congressional candidate last night who has a history. She said, I was an anonymous recovering person, but I realized I needed to come out and try to help people. And she announced what she's been through. And, and to say, you can change because of the power of the Lord. And, and we need to, to see that. So we are ransomed from slavery to sin, not just the penalty of sin, we are ransomed from the power that sin has over us. We don't have to say yes to sin. We are able to say no to sin. Do we do it perfectly? Of course we don't. <laughs> and that's because of our choices. You know, God could say, I'm just going to make you, I'm going to make you uh, perfect and you're not going to do anything wrong. He doesn't do that. We walk with the Spirit. We walk in tandem with Him. Just like we respond to the call of salvation, we respond to the the power and, and the work of the Holy Spirit to convict us and keep us from those sins. So we're, re, we're ransomed from slavery to sin by his blood. We're ransomed by the riches of his grace. Now, I, I use the word by because it fit on my slide better. The actual phrase in many of your Bibles is according to. And I looked up according to. There's about five or six different ways that can be considered. I like this way for this. According to could mean in proportion to. So I am ransomed in proportion to the riches of his grace. How deep are the riches of God's grace? They're infinite. So there's nothing I could do to out sin God's grace. You've heard the an acronym spelling out G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is. It is a gift we don't deserve. He, he gives it to us. Now, again, with all of our political talk, people say, well, we're going to tax the rich more to take care of the world. Well, guess what? The rich are going to run out of money at some point. That just that They have a, a limited supply. But when you're looking at the riches of God's grace, it's infinite. It is infinite. It, it, it'll never run out. So, According to or in proportion to God's rich grace, we can be forgiven and ransomed out of our slavery to sin. Uh, riches are spoken of six times in, in the book of Ephesians. It talks about the riches of grace twice, here in another place, the riches of his glorious inheritance, and the riches of mercy, the riches of Christ himself, and the riches of glory. Yeah, we can talk about the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That doesn't excite us anymore. We don't think about cattle as much as, as they would back then. But he owns it all. His riches are there for us, whether it's mercy, glory, Christ himself, and inheritance. He is rich toward us. and We need to know that. Now, this next thought, we are ransomed lavishly with wisdom. And when I first read that, the thought was, when I think of lavish, I think of somebody who's just pouring it out, doesn't care where it all goes. It's just poured out. I'm overflowing, and it almost seems wasted, but it's not wasted because there's so much there. But then I studied further. The wisdom is not necessarily God's wisdom at this point. We are lavished with grace and given wisdom. We are given the wisdom to understand, it says there, the mystery of God, to understand the mysteries of God's will. See, you cannot respond to the gospel unless God gives you the ability to respond to the gospel. How he does that, I do not know. But I do know that, that it's clear. It, it could be because of something. There's a, where your part and God's part comes in, I will never know. I will never know. But I know that he has to open up your heart and, and how that ha ha happens, I just trust him to do it. He gives us wisdom, and he lavishly pours out his grace. Salvation is awesome when you think about that. And then we are ransomed for a future and full unity. Okay, I want you to see where we're headed. 
there's going to be a complete unity. I used the, the F because it'd just be there twice. Future and full. We're, we're talking about Jesus bringing everything together. Not just Jew and Gentile, which is a big issue in the early church, um, but, but heaven, angels, and man. You know, in heaven and earth, everything will be coming together under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And it says it'll happen in the fullness of time. Where have I heard that phrase before? The fullness of time. In Galatians, it says Jesus was sent to be born of a woman to come to this earth. So in the fullness of time, Jesus came to offer salvation, suffer for our sins and offer salvation. There's another fullness of time in the future when he will come again and establish his kingdom and all things will be brought together. I believe we at that point are going to be more heavenly beings. Christians that are raptured, we will be part of his um, government, per se, but we're not tethered to the earth. We have already been with Jesus in heaven. We have new resurrected bodies, and we will be used by God to, to rule the earth. And, and just to see how all that, in the fullness of time, there is a future unity coming, and it's a complete, full unity. That's exciting, especially in a day and age when you think, there is no way we can deal with the divisions that are in our country. There's just no way. Well, that's why they had the prayer events, because it's only through God's the power of prayer that we can see. We start to see glimpses of unity when you think about 9-11 in 2001 and you recognize how we seem to be unit, but we immediately, you know, how long did it take before we started to drift away from one another? And even with COVID-19, it seemed like there was something there. But both times, I should say, the country as a whole didn't really look to the Lord. They looked to our own power. And even if I hear, follow the science, follow the science. Science is good, but it is not infallible. It changes as they gain more information. We need to follow the Lord. And if a pestilence has come to our country, we should might think that God is trying to get our attention. And we need to fall before him and see that he wants to ransom us from the effects of sin and the slavery of sin. There's many people that have turned their back completely on that. How can they be brought in? Some won't be brought in. and They'll be removed. We need to see that in him we have redemption. If you're a believer, you can say it that way. If you're not a believer, understand in him redemption is possible. Redemption for your sins possible, but you have to turn to him and believe in what Jesus has done for you. Going on to verse 11, verses 11 and 12, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him we have obtained an inheritance. Now, again, the more I studied, it's easy to take that passage and say, okay, that's my second point. But what does this mean? The inheritance is actually Christ's. We are given to him as a heritage. We are given to him as an inheritance. We have been given to Christ by the Father. All those that God has given to me, I will, they will come to me. He talks about the 12 disciples. He said, I have kept all that you gave to me except for the one who is destined for judgment. So, so we are the heritage. For, if, you know, Jesus, this is my inheritance, you people, these saved people. Think about that. Yeah, we, it's great to think about getting an inheritance and what God has blessed us with, and obviously that's part of it, but the picture here is more of we are a heritage for him. So we are his heritage. We are predestined according to his Purpose. Again, there's that according to again. According to here could mean in agreement with his purpose. We are predestined in agreement with his purpose. God, who is a loving God and a holy God, had a purpose to find a way to save sinners. And we are predestined to be part of that plan according to that purpose. Again, God, the whole predestination 
just has to be understood from the fact that God is timeless. He didn't do one thing and then another. Everything with him has always been. And he, you know, we see it played out in our history, but God is above that time. So that's just, that's as far as I go with the metaphysical, how to figure that out. Um, we, we are predestined according to his purpose. And praise God that his purpose is his own. We are chosen according to his counsel. There's a phrase here, according to the counsel of his will. Again, that according to, there's many things we could say, but just understand the counsel of his will is what I want to focus on here. There are two words that almost make it similar. The counsel of his will. Will is making a decision. Counsel is deliberating about that decision. And, and one, one of the writers I was reading uh, said, we may not know how God counseled himself to choose, but he does. There are reasons for his action. There are reasons. And we could try to figure out, so why did he choose some and not choose the other? I, we, you go too far down that road and you just get into arguments. <laughs> the fact is, the choice has been made and you can respond. You just need to say, have I responded to what I've come to know? Has the Spirit convicted me of my sin? Or do I understand that I need to accept the one and only Savior? That's where we need to be. We are chosen according to his counsel. The counsel of his will is the picture there. Um, then there's a phrase here that takes us away for a moment. Verse 12, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. We who were the first to hope in Christ. Who's he talking about there? All of a sudden he's talking about the Jews. All of a sudden he's talking about his, his heritage as a Jewish person that the Jewish people have a special place in God's plan. And I just want you to see, God's counsel chose the Jews as the channel of our blessings. As he chose to bless, he chose to do it through the Jews. What did he promise to Abraham in Genesis 12? In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Everyone was blessed because of the Jews. It was the line of King David, a Jew. It was through the line of King David that King Jesus came. We, we see the blessings that come from That's why in my opening prayer, I, I, I talked about the Day of Atonement, which begins at sundown. The, the, the high holy day when the priest, could, the high priest, and only him, could, only he could go into the Holy of Holies at that time. That just, that just astounds me. That, that the Jewish people, feeling close to God because of the temple, had that much. And there were so many things he had to do, and do it right. If he didn't do it right, he might die the moment he entered. You know, that there was just that recognition. And think about how quickly we say, I'm going to the throne of grace. I've been invited to the throne of grace because of the riches of God's grace poured out through Jesus' blood. I have access the Holy of Holies. There's just so much blessing there. So we praise the Lord for the Jews, and we are thankful for the Jews that have come to know Jesus as their Messiah. We know that they were the first to hope. What does he mean by that? Well, it was a Jewish church until, until the people started to scatter, scatter and, 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 and Cornelius, and, and the, at, you read through Acts, and you start to see how the, the Gentiles were welcomed. And remember Paul's ministry. He would go into the synagogue first, and as he, he would stay there as long as they would keep him. Usually it was a week, two, three weeks, and they'd kick him out. But in Ephesus, it's interesting, that was the one place he was able to stay three months in the synagogue. He was able to stay and minister first with the, with the Jewish people. Not that he didn't care about the Gentile. He knew his, his calling was to the, take the gospel to the Gentile. He met with the Jews first and then to the Greek what he says in, in, in it, um, his epistles. So we have full access to Christ along with the Jews. In fact, as a church, we think it's more interesting when we hear about Jewish people coming to know Jesus as their Savior because they have rejected for so long. They will have a day when they'll look on the one that they have pierced. And they will humble themselves. Right after they win the battle of Armageddon and Jesus comes and delivers them from it, they will turn around, look to rejoice and they'll realize who it is. 
they will repent and humble themselves before him. Okay, in him we have redemption. In him we have obtained an inheritance or our Christ heritage, however you want to read that. Verses 13 and 14. In him, also, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. In him we were sealed. In him we were sealed. How were we sealed? We were sealed by the truth. We heard the word of truth. The truth is the gospel that leads us to salvation. For those that have been trained to share the gospel using the bad news, good news, we know that the word gospel means good news, but before you get to the good news, you have to talk about the bad news. That's kind of what I did last night. I said, here are some of the issues that we, we are concerned about as, as a, a God-loving, God-fearing people or just conservative, whatever that group of people were, that just understand. But it's not the, those issues are all rooted in the sin problem. And you have to understand the good news from the, prism, uh, from the, from the perspective of the bad news. We are all sin sinners, and we fall short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. I shared that verse. That we were created in God's image, and sin has corrupted that. So we are fall short. We need a rescue. We need a redeemer. We need a ransom to be paid. We need those things. So we are sealed by the truth. We are also sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. When it says the word promise, do you remember what Jesus said in John 16 when he was in the upper room and he was telling the disciples he was going to leave them and they were said, no, 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 it's good. John 16, 7 says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. As much as we see the cross as God's plan for salvation, the final part of that plan was that his spirit would indwell us as believers, would seal us as believers. It's not just I'm saved from hell and I, I can you know, live this life. God wants to walk with us. God, we talked about this a couple, number of weeks ago. We talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Learning to hear his voice of conviction, to, to sense his power, to follow through when he, when he guides us. We, we need to not quench him. We need to not grieve him. We need to surrender to him. So we're sealed by the truth. We're sealed by the, pro, the promised Holy Spirit. And we are sealed as a deposit securing our approval. We all talk about when we die, we're going to stand before Peter at the gates of heaven. That's not what's going to happen. <laughs> we're going to see our Savior. And he's going to see the seal of the Holy Spirit and say, you are mine. You are approved. Your name is in the book of life. You are secure in that. Welcome. To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. But it's the Spirit that is the caretaker, the, the one who is with us. And as we think about the end of the world, one of the reasons I believe the rapture has to happen before the Antichrist can be fully revealed is because I believe the Holy Spirit in the church and each one of us is the restrainer that, that Paul talks about in Thessalonians. He's restraining uh, the evil that would be unleashed upon this world. But when we're taken away, that evil will have free reign. And that, that just that, that's my understanding of it. So in him... We were sealed by the truth, by the promised Holy Spirit, and that seal is a deposit. It's a security paid, again, through the blood, the grace, the riches of God's grace. It's great to sing songs about our salvation. Many times that can touch us more in, a, in a, an emotional way, and that is good. But we have to have the foundation, the bedrock of what happened in our salvation. We can share it. I can, I've shared it with mentally impaired uh, campers, and I've seen them respond to the simple message, God wants to be your special friend. And they know what wrong and right is. And they know why, when they say sorry, that they should be given because Jesus is your friend. It could be that simple, but then you could study it 
for all of eternity and not realize all the implications of the salvation that we are freely given. Now again, tying in the two passages, the two messages that we shared so far in Ephesians 1, God's choice, our blessing. We praise the triune God for his choice and our blessing. Because three times in this passage, it says to the praise of his glory. The first time it says, to the praise of his glorious grace. And that's how we ended last week. We looked at that because it was God's choice to the praise of his glorious grace. The Father chose us. But then we see too, in him we have redemption and we have obtained inheritance. That's about the work of Christ. The Son redeemed us to the praise of his glory. And then the Holy Spirit was given so that we could be sealed. So the Holy Spirit sealed us to the praise of his glory. That was my challenge last week. What are you going to do with God's choice? You can complain about it. You can deny that he made it. You can deny that he works out. God determines how he's going to share his message of salvation. God determines how he's going to bless you. Your, Your only question is, are you going to respond? How do you respond? In praise, in submission, in faith believing in what he has done for us. So we are called by the very love of God, he is love, into the perfect love of the Trinity. I love that picture. The more I study, when I look at the Trinity, I think about how they had perfect love. He had perfect love. It's hard to talk about the Trinity. Did not need to create a world to experience any more love. The love was there but they chose to create a a, a people that they could pour their love out on and invite them into the very center of the love of the Trinity. That's where I want to be. We can talk about the Holy of Holies and how it's it's open to us now, but it's it's not a place, it's with God. To know the Father who has chosen me, the Son who has redeemed me, and the Spirit who has sealed me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the truth of your word. I recognize that there's so much about you we'll never understand. We will have eternity to know, but uh, and maybe we will understand. We will we will know even as we are known. But, But I just think, how can we understand an infinite, eternal God? We will have eternity to just worship you. I pray for our nation. I pray for the events that occurred yesterday and that there would be a lasting response to that. That it's not just, oh, let's go do our duty and hope that God does something, but we would continually fall on our knees and pray for our neighbors, for our leaders, for those that need to hear the good news of the gospel, for those that lead us and and just those that would hinder the truth of your word going out. We know that you have worked in in closed countries for years, and you save as you so lead. We have had the benefits of freedom, and if they are taken away, we pray that we would be faithful to you, and we would just trust you in all that you have done. Bless each one who is here and, and hearing this message that they would understand that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, you paid such a great ransom for us. And we thank you, dear Holy Spirit, for coming into the our lives first to convict us and then to enter us and seal us as we come to saving faith. Thank you, Father, for who you are and all that you do in our lives. It's in Jesus' name.